Coming up on Tech News Today, Microsoft rides with the U.S. Marshals at their back. Android smokes Windows Phone, or did it? Kind of did. And is Comcast violating net neutrality? All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, March 26th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Big Commerce. From web design to accounting to marketing, Big Commerce provides everything you need to run a successful online business. For a limited time, get a 30 day free trial to build a fully functional store. Go to bigcommerce.com, click on the radio icon, and type in my promo code TNT. And by CorelDRAW Graphics Suite X6, introducing the most powerful version yet of the only professional graphics suite made for Windows. For a free trial plus an exclusive limited time offer, go to corel.com slash TNT, promo code TWITX6. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Jason Howell. I, as Actar, still on vacation. He'll be back with us tomorrow, but very happy to have Mr. David Hewlett along with us today, writer, actor, director, and reader of systems architecture books. <laughs> Nerd. Put the nerd in front. Probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nerd first. Welcome, nerd. Welcome, David. Uh, of course, most people probably recognize him from Cube or uh, possibly Stargate Atlantis, uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. But, yes. Uh, but you're you're a geek too. Yes, total nerd. Total nerd. That was it was it was that was torn between the whole acting thing and and then you know, I were pretending to be intelligent. You know, so I chose pretending. Now, um, just to clear this up. Are you as annoying as Dr. Rodney McKay in real life? That's what the chat room wants to know. <laughs> I, think, I, I think I think twice as much. Just as annoying. I've got his annoying and my annoying. Together. I have not found that to be true, I, I have to say, <laughs> so far. Uh, let's start off with a story about the uh, Federal Trade Commission uh, here in the United States issuing a 57-page report on privacy calling for privacy by design. Uh, simplified choices and greater transparency. These They are as good with a catchy title there. Uh, five major points here. One is do not track, which they're saying basically the, the do not track system that the browser makers are teaming up with the advertising agencies to do is great. Let them do that. Uh, the FTC wants to make mobile privacy protections short, effective, and accessible to consumers on small screens. So kind of giving a nod to those iPhone and Android controversies we've been hearing about. Uh, data brokers is the big one. They said the FTC wants a centralized website where data brokers identify themselves and disclose how they collect data. This is the only part of their recommendation that would require Congress to pass new legislation. They say we don't really need a lot of new laws except to require big data to tell people what they're collecting and what they're going to do with it. Comprehensive tracking, uh, FTC is concerned about ISPs, operating systems, browsers, and social networks comprehensively tracking users online. I think that's an, a nod towards Google and their unified privacy policy. And then uh, self-regulation. FTC said it will help enforce industry-specific codes of contact as the industry makes those. I'm mostly curious about the data brokers. Uh on the surface, you say, yeah, it would be great if we knew a little bit more about how our data was being used. But how would they identify themselves? Well, that, that's a good question. I mean, I, th I think what they would have to do is put up some kind of public policy page. Yeah. Some, some kind of description. Some sort of, yeah, like maybe above the fold, making sure that you understand what they're actually doing with information. I, I don't know how this would be used, but... It just, a lot of this seems like, yeah, in general, this seems like a good way to go. But I know that um, uh, at least one commissioner dissented for a few reasons. One of them being that a lot of these services are going to be opt-in. You know, eventually this is kind of going to work itself out a little bit more like self-regulatory rather than having all of this stuff pass. Yeah, uh, Commissioner J. Thomas Roche uh, is is upset by the idea of opt-in. I'm, I'm a big proponent of opt-in myself, but he says it shouldn't be the law of the land. I guess he has a he has a point there. There are certain things where it is unnecessary to make you have to opt-in mm -hmm. uh, for certain things where it's obvious, etc. But this is definitely the kind of thing people have been clamoring for with all of this hoopla around privacy. I mean, David, do you, are you worried about privacy and the collection of information and all this tracking that goes on online? 
I, I'm not interesting enough to to be of any you know sort of importance to people on that stuff. I think I always feel like I I, I don't I don't know why anyone would want to track what I did particularly. I and my thing with the privacy is always like if you're worried about it, then don't do it. I mean, people get freaked out about you know the whole you know giving up you know Facebook passwords and everything. Then if you then don't put stuff up there that you don't want up there. That's 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 my thing. Well, if you if you uh, if you're going to websites and they're tracking you without you knowing it, you may not know that you're giving it up. Of course, there's 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 blockers and that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. I guess, I guess that's true. I mean, if you, if you know you're being if you know you're being tracked, though, then I mean, you know, I mean, I just I just assume I assume everyone knows everything that's going on, anyways. You know, so I'm just I'm always feeling guilty. <laughs> well, I think that you know, from Scott McNeely saying, "Get over it. You have no privacy till now." I think that's a common attitude of like they're going to find out almost everything anyway but there are certain mm. things and somebody in the chat room is already making the snarky comment well give me your pin code to your atm card then obviously there's there's things that we do want private but that's not what this is talking about this is saying you know when you're online how much tracking should be allowed i i i'm kind of with you on the opt-in if i if i have choices and i can't you know i either have uh you know very private semi-private or not private at all or I can opt into certain services where I'm going to have to give up a little bit more of my anonymity in order to get, um, you know, ads that are targeted better to me. All that stuff, to me, choice is good. I think uh, what the FTC is concerned about is it, if so many companies have have so many different choices and we have all of these uh, legal documents to read and people continue to be confused, then we're going to continue to have all these privacy issues because it's it's not... It's not clear. I, I'm not one that's worried about, I, like you, David, I, I, I don't feel like I'm that interesting that people really are going to find a lot of things out about my behavior online that's, that's going to be so worrisome. I just would like to know. And so I, I've, I support this FTC initiative in so much as it says you should reveal what kind of things you're collecting and where mm -hmm. and give me a little bit of control over it. I think the, the idea with big data could be like what Google does with its transparency. It says this is the data we have about you. Here's a chance to clear it out delete it etc i think that that is a good idea uh yeah definitely i think i i agree with your i mean you as you say if you, if you if you don't know you're being tracked that's the issue i think more than anything else i mean the scary thing that happens we've got you know with the kid i've got a four-year-old uses the ipad and loves all these free apps that you can get well you know if they're tracking that's that's a little scary to me yeah yeah it's just it's all about knowledge knowledge is power also uh powerful is <laughs> rating Hosting companies. Uh, I, I love these. I love these uh, articles where they're talking about Microsoft with the backing of U.S. Marshals storming into web hosts. It was probably much more boring than that. They probably walked up with some. You don't think words. they were holding machetes and no. hacked down the door and <laughs> you know threw a grenade or two? Probably not. Here's what's going on: uh, a civil suit under a warrant and backed by U.S. Marshals gave Microsoft employees the power. And when we say employees, we don't mean the programmers. It was probably, you know, people from their legal team to enter hosting services in Scranton, Pennsylvania and Lombard, Illinois to seize servers and take possession of hundreds of Internet domain names uh, to shut down the Zeus botnet. The servers were allegedly being used to spread multiple versions of the Zeus botnet. You know, the Zeus botnet's one where you can rent out time on it. Uh, the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center, along with NACHA, obtained the warrants with Microsoft for the seizures through the RICO Act, the one that you, the Racketeering Act that allows you to go after the mob. Microsoft called this in, in great Microsoft naming fashion, Operation B-71. Uh, <laughs> And along with the, the RICO Act uh, accusation claimed that the phishing emails used to spread the botnet infringed on their trademarks and intellectual property. So the big question at the end of this is, OK, Microsoft's done this several times before. This is their new thing. Go civil suits, shut down botnets. This is the biggest one they've done. First time they've ever done multiples. Does it have an effect? Does it actually does it actually work? Because they're not actually going after the people. It, it it seems like you know it, it's like an attack at the speed of law on something that moves at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't. It's like a. It's it's just that the slow legal process to try to shut down something that will be up and running again in a in a in a few minutes, basically. I mean, but then you know if 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 Microsoft were to say, well, we're never really going to kill it, so we shouldn't try at all. I mean that doesn't seem like a good solution either. I just yeah, I wouldn't don't. say give up on it. Yeah. I wouldn't say give up on it, but I would, I, I would just, I would think that there would be some kind of technology-based approaches as opposed to this sort of very slow and, and uh, although it, it, it does sound a lot cooler to say marshals at the end of something, though, you know. Yeah, you got, right. 
kind of hard to say that we shut them down with our program. We they could call the program like the Marshals. Just come up with a good acronym. For come up it. with a cool yeah. name for exactly. it. And then, yeah. Well, Richard Boscovich uh, is the senior lawyer at Microsoft Digital Crimes Unit. He used to be a federal prosecutor. He used to, you know, go after the actual, like, physical world bad guys. So I, I imagine he is the one spearheading this idea, or at least Microsoft has asked him to. And he says that what this does is send a message that we can see you, that we're after you. He's, he says, of course, we're not going to shut down all the botnets by getting a couple servers. But it, it lets them know that we're on to them. I thought the idea was you didn't want them to know you're on to them because then they then they hide and they make it. Well, I think in a in a perfect utopian society, there wouldn't be any botnets. So, I mean, in in one way, Microsoft sort of like, hey, we're going to find you. Perhaps you could do something else with your time. That's asking we'll a lot. But or, that would or go be after the, the people who are paying for it. I mean, the people who are paying for that yeah. service to spam people get those put those guys in jail. Yeah, well, that's what always gets me with these uh, copyright laws that are put forth saying, you know, stop all the credit card processing of, of any company accused of copyright infringement. I'm like, can't we do that for the malware? That seems more important to me right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, meanwhile, there is actual hardware news out there. Nokia has announced that the Lumia 900 Windows phone, uh, their big U.S. Uh, Windows phone, will be coming to AT&T on April 8th for 100 bucks. This is, this is not a bad phone. It's got a nice uh, unibody design, 4.3-inch AMOLED screen, 8-megapixel camera. I love this little guy. 16-gig uh, of storage, megapixel front-facing camera, too, and $99. This is and, – and what the funny thing is, April 8th, Windows phone from HTC, the Titan 2, also coming out for $200. It's got a little bit of a bigger screen, 4.7-inch, but it's only a super LCD. So they are really bringing down the price of the Lumia 900. Now – Call me a little nuts. You're I'm a about little nuts. To, I'm about to go on a rickety little limb here, but it seems like Microsoft would love to flood the market with Windows phones, making them inexpensive enough so that people are more inclined to buy them so that they can hooked into the OS and then say, yeah, Windows phone, that's the kind of phone that I use. They are spending billions of dollars to get Nokia to switch over to using Windows phone for all their smartphones. Mm-hmm. And now uh, this is probably where some of those billions of dollars are going is to subsidize this because the Lumia 900 should not be a $99 phone. Is this going to work, David? Or is this going to get people storming in saying, yeah, $99, Lumia 900, Windows phone for me? I I'm always very skeptical of, of, of Microsoft's approach on these things. But, you know, I, and I was very skeptical of Xbox. I mean, I thought, like, they were ridiculous. They're putting all this money into Xbox and they were just weren't going to win. I mean, they just had no market share. They, they did it that way. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past them. I mean, I, I, I think, I think the, the, the problem is there's just how many of these phones are going to be? I mean, there's just, it seems like there's a new phone every month. I mean, if there are people upgrading that fast, I'm not. Yeah. I'm a nerd. It, apparently also, they are. Well, also, Tom, to your point where you say this should not be a $99 phone. And we've talked about this before, uh, getting, uh, you know, Windows phones into the hands of many people is, is that's obviously the goal, but you don't want to appear desperate, and if you're giving away a phone that you could charge more for, I think that there is a perception that there's something wrong with you. Well, right. already in the chat room, some people are like, why not just get a $99 Android or the older iPhone? And mm. and that, that's what's interesting is this is a much better phone than any $99 Android phone, isn't it, Jason? I mean... I mean, I mean, yeah, it's it's a fantastic phone. I think, like you guys have said, though, when you when you debut a great phone at a ninety nine dollar price, I think that there's just a percentage of people that see the ninety nine dollar price and in their minds lump they it in think that it's same some category. Sort of a subpar phone. Yeah, exactly. They're like, giving them away. That, so they should price it at three hundred dollars <laughs> right. and then give you a two hundred dollars yes. rebate. <laughs> right. They can't win. They get, they're I damned know, if right? they do. They're damned if they don't. Right? Yeah. It, that that kind of is the problem. And 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 a lot of people are like, "Why are you hating on the phone?" Not hating on the phone. It's a great. It's a phone. nice phone. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm I'm not even hating on, but we're concerned about is, it, it, does Windows Phone have a chance to grab people's attention? What is the market share on Windows phones right now? I mean, what's the? It's I below five. No sense of it. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, depending on how you count it, it can be up to fourteen percent if you slice the numbers various ways. But it's still it's it's not it's not dominant, not even, not even like, close. Again, I use the Xbox thing. I mean, the, the Xbox was I mean they were they were a non it was like it was a non entity when when they, when it first started, and they just bought their way into that market, and now it's, they're doing fantastically with it. Yeah, I'm not sure that it's as easy to do. I mean, the the thing about that marketplace is you only had a couple of competitors, whereas mm -hmm. as you mentioned, you've got. You know, hundreds of, of models of phones and lots of different manufacturers out there. Uh, 
but who, but who knows? We'll we'll see how this goes. We do know that one thing they're doing probably isn't working in their favor right now. The smoked by Windows Phone plan. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, but uh, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, BigCommerce.com. The internet uh, has opened a huge opportunity for businesses of all sizes to reach customers. And if you are thinking, you know, I'd like to do some e-commerce, I'd like to have a store online, but it's all complicated, we got the thing for you. Untapped revenue that you're not taking advantage could be flowing into your store with Big Commerce. It will provide you with all the tools needed to set up and run a successful online store. If you're worried about the complications of it all, this is the thing to investigate. Big Commerce is one-stop shop. They can give you your web design. They can give you your shopping carts. They can give you your shipping, your marketing. Uh, they can help you with your social networking of sites, uh, accounting, analytics. It's the whole package. They've helped drive almost $750 million in sales for businesses in just the past two years. They are the solution to drive the most sales for your business right away. And you can try them out because you're a Tech News Today listener or viewer uh, with a limited time offer just for you. 30-day free trial. Give it, give it a chance. Start, start, a, start a store. Take your existing business or business idea you've had and take 30 days to build it up. You'll see how easy it is. No expense to build a fully functional store Nothing to lose, everything to gain. Set up your online store for free today. Go to bigcommerce.com, click on the radio icon at the top of the homepage, and type in the promo code TNT. That's bigcommerce.com. And remember to enter TNT. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. So as I mentioned, Microsoft's running a promotion called Smoked by Windows Phone. Uh, various prizes in various stores. They, they were $100 now. Recently, they've been doing one uh, with a laptop that's worth about $1,000. You, you get in line. You come up. You turn off your phone. They turn off the Windows Phone. You, neither one of you know what the challenge is going to be. Then they announce the challenge. Like something you, like, look up this address Yeah, really right. And uh, yeah. find something on a map. Mm -hmm. And then whoever does it uh, fastest wins. And if you do it faster than the Windows Phone, then... You get the thousand dollar laptop, or even a, a chance to swap for the phone that you just beat. It didn't make any sense to me, but anyway, <laughs> uh, Sunday, <laughs> slight flaw. Yeah, I know. Sunday, Sahas Kata says on his blog he won the challenge by sheer luck. So he turned off his phone. He had previously disabled slide to unlock. So as soon as he pressed power, he was going right to his home screen. So that was one mm -hmm. advantage because the Windows Phone you had to unlock. Second advantage was he didn't know this before he turned off his phone, but the challenge was find the weather in two different locations. He had a widget on his home screen, on his Android phone, for Berkeley and San Jose weather. So they said, okay, find the weather in two different cities, go. He pressed power and said, done. And they went, no. And they said, no, that doesn't count. But why doesn't it count if they didn't explain that a widget was insufficient? Well, According to their rules, it is sufficient. Uh, so they started making. But that's making, what I mean. They, they started can't making say stuff no, up. They said, win. "Oh, well, yeah, it's just because." First of all, which is a horrible. Thing that's to something say. that my mom and then, says to states. me. Different states? Didn't they say different states? Yeah, then, that's be, right. Study the weather then, in two different states. They said, "Oh, it has to be in two different states." That's not in the rules. <laughs> uh, and then they 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 finally just kind of you know shuffled him out and said, "You know, sorry, that's get out of here." They made him take a picture saying, "My phone got smoked by Windows Phone," even though it didn't. <laughs> oh, seriously? That's they what he says in his blog. Yeah. They, they, oh, that's can, great. You, can you imagine? You go up to, you know, you're, you're this kind of an all in good fun type of a thing. You might win a little bit of money. You win and you're like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. And they're like, no, you didn't. Just because. Had to be two different states. Here, now take a picture. Well, Smile. I, I get what the Microsoft employees are reacting to because he didn't do anything, right? right? The point of the competition is you're going to try to pull up this thing yeah. and your app loads and the internet connection and we've got a you know LTE phone with a faster processor and it's going to beat you and so they're mad because he didn't do anything but he didn't know what the challenge was ahead right. of he time has exactly. equal, so it's equal not possibility like he punked anybody doing really well he just well. got lucky yeah exactly but if things... they were smart they would say the only way to beat the windows phone is by you know complete luck <laughs> right. Yeah. Spin it, spin it slightly differently, and then maybe give them a laptop, and they could have solved themselves a lot of trouble. But well, this, no mor kidding. this morning, Microsoft evangelist Ben Rudolph on Twitter said, "Hey, Sasha or uh, Sahaskata, uh, I want to make things right. I've got a laptop and phone, and apology for you. Email me." So they yeah. are. After a decent amount of ribbing by the press, and yeah, Microsoft yeah. itself isn't doing anything, but their evangelist is out there saying, "Hey, let's 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 figure this out." That's smart. 
Now, Paul Therott, uh has a, has a post up that I haven't looked at until right now. He says, um, according to an account of another tech blogger who visited the Microsoft store, the task he randomly received was to bring up the weather of two different cities. He coincidentally had two weather widgets. Okay, we said that. Uh, according to his account, the blogger only narrowly defeated Windows Phone despite having pre-configured his phone in a very unusual and insecure way. So uh, Paul's trying to say, look, you know, the reality of the competition it didn't destroy it. it. Even it with these two the advantages, wind. Windows Phone almost. So beat. is this this is straight from a uh, startup from boot up, right? Like this is your phones are off and you have to go through the boot up process. So if that's the is that is that well, the way it is? Screen off. It's just screen. Off. I bet it's oh, just screen okay. off. All right. Yeah. And so that's why the guy was like, as soon as they said weather in two, he was like, score. Yeah. (laughs) You know, so I think what Paul Throtz said on Win Super site is this doesn't actually prove that Windows Phone got smoked, Mm -hmm. which I would say is right. But it also, he won the contest. Yeah, they should have just, if they'd said that right off the bat. If he, that they should have that should have been their immediate response. It was like, oh my god, you beat us, but only because you didn't have security yeah. because of this. That would have been, and smart. they could have publicized that, and they would have then they would look like heroes. Right, and I think they're trying to backtrack, but it's too late. Having said point. that, I would have kicked the guy out of the. I, I, I'm such a bad loser. I would have. I would have kicked him out. <laughs> take the photo too. Showed him the door. Yeah, For made me. him take a photo with me yeah. first, though. Right, <laughs> saying that I smoked him. Yeah. All right, let's move on to. Uh, the Facebook password request saga continues. Password gate. Yeah, no one's actually calling it that. Uh, the AP is now reporting that uh, a couple senators, we talked already about Chuck Schumer um, of New York, but now Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, or maybe it was Richard Blumenthal originally, and now uh, Chuck Schumer is on board, have announced they're calling for an official probe into whether asking for a password by an employer to a uh, potential employee breaches either the Stored Communications Act that bans uh, intentional access to digital information without permission or and or the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. That one prohibits intentional access to a computer without authorization to gain information. Of course, we did talk about that this is this kind of this this entire issue um, at length last week, Facebook has already spoken out uh, against the practice saying, listen, if you're an employer and you're asking an employee for uh, their Facebook password in order to get a job, not only are you breaching our terms of service, but it's not past us to go after an organization if we know for sure that you're doing this. And you are opening yourself up to discrimination cases against you by employees. You might find out more than you bargained for um, if you're looking into uh, their private information. Legislation That's a is- very savvy response. Yeah. On their part. I mean, that's really smart. By saying, look, you guys could get sued if you do this. Like, that's that's going to back people off so quickly. Very true. Legislation being proposed in Illinois and Maryland to ban employers from even asking for unrestricted access, not just to Facebook passwords, but email accounts and social networks in general. Uh, the AP uh, says similar bills have been introduced in both California and Massachusetts. So, you know, we could we could talk about whether asking for passwords is in fact technically illegal because of these acts. But then there is sort of the other side of the coin. Forbes uh, in, a, in a statement today in a, in, a, in a post about this whole controversy calls it the great Facebook employee password non-issue uh, saying, listen, most of these cases that we're talking about are isolated incidents involving government employees or people in law enforcement. A lot of the stuff took place more than two years ago. Um, there's, a, there's an ACLU case where uh, the Maryland Department of Corrections uh, was uh, accused of shoulder surfing. That's the practice of not needing uh, to actually gain anyone's password, but basically looking over someone's shoulder as they click around so that you feel like, okay, I get a sense of what you do in Facebook and I'm okay with that. Uh, ACLU said, shoulder surfing, this is horrible. Uh, Maryland had then backed down and said, okay, it'll be a voluntary sharing thing. We're not going to force anybody to do this. So, you know, it's I, I'm starting to feel a little bit like the idea that employees are forcing employee, uh, potential employees to give their password is much more of an issue than the actual issue. Yeah, it doesn't sound like anybody's actually doing it anymore. Yeah. And, and if they are, they're probably not going to for very long. I don't know. I guess we're, we're seeing uh, a lot of enraged senators, which is, hey, you know, the, if, if this was a rampant issue, then that's a good thing. People should be enraged about it. I just don't know. I don't know how big the issue is, how widespread it actually is. 
Are you worried, David, that your next uh, potential employer is going to ask for your Facebook password? Well, the problem is that I would, I would be terrified of anyone looking back at any of the stuff that I've done. But unfortunately, mine's all on television. <laughs> you can't so stop it's, it, right? It's, I can't stop it. Yeah, there's nothing – I can't take it. I can't take that stuff back. Well, uh, No, I, again, I just – my thing – I mean you had, the, you had the best point the other day when you, when you said you know, pregnancy would be the big thing. I mean, the idea of being able to go onto a, fe- a Facebook page and see that someone was pregnant, though they weren't visibly pregnant during the, the interview, and then not hiring them for that reason – that's why I think Facebook's, you know, legal response is very smart because it's just saying like, OK, but you find out I'm pregnant and I don't get the job. I'm coming after you type thing. So do we need laws that say you can't do this or is it will this take care of itself? I would have thought this would take care of itself. I mean, I, I, it seems it's by the time they got the law sorted out, will there be something other something different than Facebook? At least some other giant, you know, thing that everyone wants to share their photos on or whatever I, I, I facebook is such a non-issue for me because i just i don't use it i don't understand it it makes me feel very old well and it is hilarious <laughs> i mean as you point out like so so much of it is public anyway uh, people make mm. their facebook profiles public uh that's a that's a, another story is people you know putting things public that they shouldn't uh and that you pr- if you're a prospective employee you don't really need their password right well and what one of the ones one of the cases they had down here was was the guy who was was he was a he was going to be a prison official, and they wanted to check to make sure that he wasn't gang affiliated. And I just mm-hmm. thought, like, I'm sorry, but what, you know, what, who puts their gang affiliation on their face? Is there, is there a section for in Facebook for gang affiliation? I mean, organization, you know, I guess you could use, you could repurpose. That's it. Maybe a photo of your gang tat. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Clubs. I suppose if you're that, <laughs> you know, if you're that foolish, though, chances are. You may not get the job for other reasons. I think what's going to happen is as long as we all talk about this, people will continue to make little dummy second Facebook accounts. Yeah. And if you ever get into a situation like this, you can say, here's my Facebook account. It's great. That is a violation of the Facebook terms of service, though. Oh, shoot. You know, so. I tried. (laughs) But I think you're right. I think that's what people do. You know, it's just uh, more and more people will will realize that, you know, if you have something that's that's very damaging to, you know, your brand or a potential job that you might have. Then that's all the more reason to strip it out. Yep. Well, what are the stats on divorce are, are interesting that way because that's so that that Facebook is being cited in so many cases of divorce. And I can't remember what the numbers are, but it's something ridiculously high because you know because people were you know logging into their their wives or husbands' Facebook accounts and discovering stuff that they didn't want to know. Yeah, it's uh, that and text messaging. I think was yeah. the other one that was really high. Oh, is it really? Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Like yeah. the, both of those are, are are places to find the evidence that you're looking for in a divorce case. That's true. All right, finally, let's finish up with uh, some net neutrality questions about Comcast. Here's what they're doing. Uh, We've mentioned previously that Comcast was going to provide video on demand through the Xbox 360. They've been in beta for that. We've been waiting for after 2012 for it to roll out to all Comcast customers. News today is that it looks like that might happen in the next few weeks. Uh, There is also some updated terms of service and, and policy guidelines on the Comcast website that say Comcast's on-demand videos through the Xbox 360 will not count towards customers' 250 gigabyte monthly data limit because they are, quote, being delivered over our private IP network and not the public internet. Comcast uh, clarified that cable subscribers who use a different internet service provider would not be able to stream content through their Xbox 360. So you have to have both the Comcast television service and Comcast Internet service for this to work at all. And you have to have an Xbox Live Gold subscription. So this isn't like the wide open Internet, but groups like Public Knowledge have already come out and said, hey, this is a slippery slope. This is how it starts. Comcast competes with Netflix by saying, sure, you can watch Netflix on the Xbox or you can watch our on-demand video, which doesn't count against your bandwidth cap. But Mm. you already have the TV service. I mean, I have Comcast Internet at home, but I do not have Comcast TV so if I bought myself an Xbox 360, I can't just all of a sudden get Comcast on demand. Right. So I, it's... That's what Comcast is saying I have is, Netflix in part because I don't have TV service. We're just using your Xbox 360 as another set-top box. This right. is no different than having a set-top box. And in fact, you have to have at least one set-top box already somewhere in the house for this to work. Why? I don't know what the technical reason is why, but that's what it says in their policy. So it's really more like, hey, if you like the, if you like the Xbox 360 interface then we'll give you some programming because you're already paying us for all this stuff. It seems like more a matter of convenience than a net neutrality issue to me. It's like the HBO On Demand. You can have HBO On Demand over the internet as long as you have access to their, as long as you you order their cable service as well or their satellite service, whatever it is. If you order their channel, you can then 
also now stream it over the internet, but you can't do it. You yeah, can't you can't it. get it a la carte. Well, and, yeah. and that's a really good example because why that isn't controversial is HBO doesn't also run your internet service. Exactly. And so yeah. because Comcast does, it causes the appearance of some sort of conflict, even if there isn't, for them to say, well, we're not going to count this against your bandwidth cap. And the question I have, because I actually don't think this is a violation of net neutrality, simply because of the fact that you have to have the television service too. However, why do they need to... How can they not count this against your bandwidth cap if it's going over their local network? Because the congestion they're trying to fight with the bandwidth cap would conceivably be on the local network. Yeah, the congestion isn't their issue at all, is it? I no, mean, it's not. I'm, I think the reason why they throw in that part about it being over their over their their own their own network is just to is just to, to take it away from the net neutrality issue. So people don't you know, so it isn't a huge outcry about the fact that they're basically just you know making it easier to get their content over their you know, themselves, you know, get it from them as opposed to from Netflix. I mean, Netflix is just being, I, I feel sorry for Netflix because Netflix came up with a brilliant idea, you know, which was that basically the, the best bandwidth available was, was, was on still on DVD through the mail. And, uh, and then they've slowly turned it into a on-demand service. And basically everyone's jumped on the same bandwagon now and they're trying to sort of force them out. Well, and that means they had a good idea, I guess, right? If, if everybody's right idea, after yeah. them. Uh, so competition can be good for us as consumers because then we get more more choices if that's the way it goes. But I think the worry here is that you'll actually end up with fewer choices because bandwidth caps will prevent you from taking best advantage of a Hulu or a, or a Netflix where you'll be forced to watch Xfinity on demand because mm -hmm. that's the way you don't run up against your bandwidth cap. Yeah. Although a 250 gigabyte cap still gives you quite a lot of room to watch a lot of Netflix. If that's yeah, what you want to but do. again, as but as the quality improves, as you yeah. know, I mean, I've got I got a four year old. Yeah, you know, that's why he watches a lot of a lot of streaming stuff. And is that cap going to rise? Is the cap going to grow with your child? <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, exactly. Probably <laughs> yeah. not. Exactly. All right, let's uh, move on to the news. news. Remember how we told you last week uh, that Nokia, Motorola, and RIM weren't very happy with Apple's competing proposal for a nano SIM card? Mm -hmm. you, you do. Mm. You don't? I was there. Well, we told you. Listen closer next time, people. Turns out Apple's doing some wooing of the European standards body, Etsy, not, not the craft place, but the ETSI. In a letter seen by Florian Miller, Apple committed to offering a royalty-free license to any of its patents deemed essential to its nano SIM standard. So it's... Time to work on a patent bribes graphic, I guess. As Apple CEO Tim Cook visited China last week, which is the second largest market after the U.S. for Apple, Chinese website Cinetech cited knowledgeable sources claiming a future iOS update may replace Google search with Baidu search as early as next month. Baidu currently holds 83% of China's search market. So a move like this is pretty much a nail in the coffin for any hopes Google has of making it as a company. <laughs> They're done. Yeah. yeah. Forget it. It's curtains. Sell your Google stock, folks. Yep, it's over. Poor Huawei. Uh, just because they have a few former Chinese military folks running their company, they can't catch a break. Australia, as you may know, is spending $38 billion to create a national broadband network. Huawei wanted a little piece of that action. Who wouldn't? But the Australian government has said there is no role for one of the world's largest telecom equipment makers, citing security concerns. So... No Huawei devices in the Australian broadband network. Or Huawei. I'm surprised people aren't making a bigger thing out of this, to be honest, because that's, you know, this this sort of it, it's it, it sounds a bit like, you know, the Cold War all over again. You know, we're we're worried about, you know, who owns the companies. And I mean, I, I see definitely see both sides of it. And I've also been to Australia and boy, they need faster Internet. Yeah, definitely. It drove me crazy and it drives them crazy, I think. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's just, to me, this is actually, I would have thought this would be a much more high profile story because, you know, it's, it, that's them's fighting words. Yeah. You're build you're, you might build spy things in the back door of your router. So we're not going to buy oh, any. We don't want Chinese companies coming into our town. I mean, it just, it's, it sounds a bit, a bit backwards to me. Yeah. I, I, I'm, in, I'm interested to see if there is a backlash against this, but I'm not sure where it would come from other than China, mm. which Huawei. Well, yeah. And Huawei, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They are not happy. You know who else isn't happy? 83-year-old Evelyn Poswall. She broke her nose on a glass door at an Apple store in Manhasset, New York, <laughs> and is suing Apple for $1 million. Her I am so going to the Apple store and tripping over something. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, I can kind of see where this is 
where this could happen. Her attorney says Apple wants to be cool and modern and have the type type of architecture that appeals to the tech crowd, but they have to appreciate the danger that this high tech modern architecture poses to some people. I feel sorry for the window washer mm. at the Apple store, who obviously is just doing his or her if job very, left very it a well. Streaky, this would never have happened. Streaks, not a bad thing. Well, I think the Retina display is the next danger. It's so clear. I just want. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ah, uh, okay, sure. When you type Dave Hewlett into Google, one of the autocomplete suggestions is apology. But he's not suing Google over reminding him of his tragic rap problem, is he? Are you? Yet. 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 Okay. Give it time. Well, you may want to consider this story. Things are different in Japan. A Japanese court has made a provisional order for Google to delete specific terms from its autocomplete search feature that associate a man with his crimes he claims not to be involved with. This is not the first time Google has run into trouble with the law for its algorithm implying things about people in autocomplete. And well done, buddy, for keeping such a low profile and doing a lawsuit and then drawing more attention to yourself. <laughs> right, it's the Streisand before. effect. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it's it, with, they've also done it in France, too, right? There was a, That's there was right. a company in France. Yep. That was, <laughs> that was the other time. <laughs> what were they down as? They were, I can't remember. There was a two, they, their name was associated with, was it Con and Crook Yeah, it was Scam. Or like scam or Con. Or, <laughs> yeah, right. That's it. An unfortunate algorithm. Indeed. Happens to every Rick Santorum. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Single sign-on services like OpenID, Google, and Facebook Connect are all very convenient. But a team of researchers say they're also plagued with vulnerabilities. The results of a 10-month-old study will be presented at the IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy in May that show single sign-on services are prone to flaws that allow adversaries unauthorized access to private user profiles on the third-party websites that use them, which sucks because I use them a lot. Mm -hmm. Particularly oh, really? See, I'm, that's one thing I am paranoid about. That's one of the things that I just, I, I've never trusted that one sign-on thing. Do you, what I'm about... The, you're, you're, you, don't, you don't click on the Facebook Connect button on never, websites? Never. Open ID yeah. even? I never do. Like it's, I've just wow. never used it. I, I don't know. And I don't know why. It's just, it's, it's like a big brother thing for me. It's yeah. just, it's Turns a out you were right. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you're certainly not alone. But I it, use the Twitter. I like the Twitter OAuth. I do too. That one yeah. feels like it's done better. And why me. do you feel? I feel that way too, and I don't know why. But I, if I have the choice, I always go with Twitter. But I don't. You know, it's it's silly because it takes me to Twitter, and I can see that I've got SSL on, mm -hmm. and and I'm not. I'm usually just giving an app authorization. I'm not actually logging in. Yeah, there's a little more that you feel like you're you're giving up your firstborn with Facebook. Where yeah. It's like I have the potential to write on your wall, write on your friend's wall, write yeah, on your mom's right. wall, write. Well, Twitter totally. seems okay. simpler, doesn't it? I mean, Twitter somehow seems simpler as well. It's it's, it's just cleaner. It just even just yeah. the logo looks cleaner. Also, I have less in Twitter. What are they going to find? My tweets? They're all public anyway. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what am I worried about? Yeah, don't. And now everybody's going. Oh, great. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's 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 look at some other controversy still swirling over the licensing of OnLive's desktop viewer application. That's the one that allows you to run limited Windows applications on an iPad, including Microsoft Office. Uh, one competitor, Nivio, is bringing similar functionality that works across multiple operating systems, including Android and OS X. Uh, so it's not limited to just iOS. And they properly licensed it using Microsoft's server provider license agreement. Nivio isn't free, though. The service starts at $5 or 5 euros for 10 hours use per month. And Unlimited runs you $15 or 15 euros a month. But it does give you Microsoft Office and a bunch of other apps. You know, you can't use uh, Internet Explorer to just browse the web in that online desktop. Uh, yes, I do know that. Yeah. Because I tried. I tried, too. And I said, what? Why not? And they said, because. And I said, well, screw you. No, I didn't. Actually, I like online quite a bit. Since its launch last year, 75,000 businesses have opted into Square's card case application. And now it's got a new name and a new look. It's been renamed Pay with Square, which quite frankly makes a lot more sense, and brings hands-free geofencing functionality previously only available in the iOS app to Android as well. Jason, I'm sure you're excited about that. Mm -hmm. And offers a new carousel of featured merchants that are close to your location for better discovery. You can also favorite a merchant, tweet about a merchant, share a merchant on Facebook, SMS, or email a link to a merchant to a contact. So it's a really good time to be a merchant, apparently, yeah. if you're associated with Square. You're going to get a lot of tweets and love and Facebook posts and carousel love. Good for the merchant marine. Yeah.
If you'd like to send a link to that Linux ISO you spotted on the Pirate Bay to a friend over instant message, don't use Windows Live Messenger. You'll just end up with a message that says, the link you tried to send was blocked because it was reported as unsafe. The Verge reports that links to sites like Demonoid worked over Windows Live Messenger without incident, so it's not a ban on torrent links in general. Uh, likely the Pirate Bay's ads trip some sort of automatic malware block is our best guess. There's a great. I don't know if you if you saw this. Uh, there was a there was a TED Talks about uh, copyright math. Oh yeah, Rob you Reed. See that? Yeah, genius, absolute genius. Basically saying that you know by walking around with an iPad, you're walking around with you know, potentially what was it something like the, like 750 thousand jobs. Yeah, I can't remember what the awesome. number was, but it was. It was I mean, fantastic. I'm making up. I'm now making up Hewlett math. Yeah, is another it, another form of it. But that is a perfectly yeah. legitimate form of math in some yeah. countries. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's move to randomizer. Randomizer. I mean, move there. Let's all just pack up. Where is move randomizer? To randomizer, the country <laughs> that It'll brings be you interesting. things. Like the Smithsonian bringing classic arcade games to life at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Ina Freed had this story on all things D. Uh, folks uh, throwing balls at aliens to bring space invaders. Families posing with flowers, clouds, and stars doing their Mario impressions. Uh, this is some good geeky fun for the Smithsonian. I'm digging it. I am too. I'm morally opposed to it because it's um, it, it's it makes it makes video games into actual um, uh, exercise. Ah, <laughs> oh, good point. Yeah. You know, like there is I, a little bit of running around in there. That's true. I say to my son, "Do you want to play basketball?" and and he runs outside, and, and I run to the Xbox. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, yeah. that's how we play basketball these days. Exactly. But <laughs> Why I, get up and throw a ball when I I really them? like I really like this seeing people do. I love video this. games in real life because that when you're a kid you kind of imagine like what would yeah. it be like to be in the mm -hmm. game and that's what they're doing at the at the smithsonian here it's pretty cool all right i want to see that footage i want to see that footage of you like dressed up as pac-man or a ghost running around one of these days someone will get the password to my facebook account and you will find you will see <laughs> where the only copy of the video lives, lives yes exactly the most secure <laughs> place i could think of my facebook account <laughs> As this, Miss Pac-Man. Right. Uh, sadly, probably. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Corel Draw Graphics Suite X6. Uh, we all know pictures worth a thousand words, if not more. And to get a great picture, what makes the difference is having powerful, versatile, and easy-to-use sets of tools that you can trust. That's why the new Corel Draw Graphics Suite X6 combines vector illustration, page layout, photo editing, web design software, everything you need to express your style and creativity. That's great for web graphics. You're making logos. You're making some flyers, brochures, billboards, even car wraps. You know, things that go all the way around the car. You need to make one of those. Corel Draw, One Rev Photo Editing, Graphics Suite X6, X6 includes everything for both experienced and aspiring designers in one affordable package. You get like 10,000 clip art images in there, 1,000 stock photos, 1,000 fonts, 250 templates, uh, training videos if you need them, a typography engine. Uh, try it out for free. Get your free 30-day trial version of Corel Draw Graphics Suite X6 plus an exclusive limited time offer at Corel.com, C-O-R-E-L.com slash T-N-T. If you decide to buy Corel Draw, use the promo code TWITX6 for an exclusive 10% off. Uh, that offer varies by country. Special offer available through April 30th. So go try it now, Corel.com slash T-N-T. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. What's on the calendar, Sarah? Tomorrow, March 27th, Google I.O. registration opens. You may remember from last year that it goes quickly. It's first come, first serve as far as registering online, and it starts at 7 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Also, the registration uh, attendee prices are up quite a bit. General attendee, 900 bucks a pop, um, and then a student or faculty ticket is 300 So if you're interested... You got to be on top of it. It's like concert tickets or something. Um, and also tomorrow, Y Combinator Demo Day is happening at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. What now? Y Combinator Demo Day is that people who are already in Y Combinator who come out and demo their startups, or are they people trying to get Y Combinator to let them in and, and fund them? Well, that's you, a, I, you know I'm, what? I'm that's a really that. good. Um, give me a second, and I'll tell All right. you. <laughs> Let's Frantic move. reading. We'll move on to incoming. Incoming message. Uh, we actually have 
two emails from one person today, but they were so good, we're going to read them both. Uh, Simon in Liverpool says, as someone whose job entails building visualization components for the semantic web, I listened with interest to the apps versus HTML5 discussion on TNT 464. While Tom's comment about the historic swings between open and proprietary technologies rang true, sadly, I'm not sure this applies to HTML5. Here's why. I don't see HTML5 as an app killer. Rather, it's a first step towards web standards that might one day rival apps. Although touted as the future of app development, HTML5's key components are embryonic and lack the sophistication of their Android or iOS counterparts. Worse, at its core, HTML5 remains a document-centric technology dominated by concepts like paragraphs, margins, and flowing text. The W3C have failed to promote any user interface-centric alternative akin to Mozilla's XUL that might standardize app-like widgets and layout managers for browsers. Sure, given ample quantities of patience in JavaScript, one can work around these omissions, but the more workarounds one employs, the greater the likelihood of browser-specific quirks, which is why we see a lot of HTML5 apps only working in one particular browser. Uh, Simon says, sorry to be a pessimist, but I suspect we must wait for HTML6 to get a toolkit anywhere near current Android or iOS standards. Yes, given sufficient effort, it is possible to get 486-era games running within select browsers. Just don't expect an influx of Infinity Blade clones anytime soon. I want Infinity Blade and HTML5, but this is a really good uh, reality check on what HTML5 can and cannot do. Yeah. And and JavaScript being worked in does kind of fudge it. So you think, oh, but that's HTML5. Look, look at it. Look, they're running it Doom. It isn't necessarily what is impressing you. It's not you. just the HTML5 part of it that's doing it. Uh, real quick, yes. It's Y Combinator's latest batch of startups okay, cool. presenting to investors. So there you have it. Uh, next email from, hey, this is a familiar name, Simon from Liverpool. Yeah, Simon wrote us twice, and hey, he had two good emails, so we're reading them both. Sorry for the second email of the day. I just wanted to draw your attention, if it slipped your notice in the Reddit, as it did mine, towards the petition to get the father of modern computing, Alan Turing, as the replacement for Charles Darwin on future 10-pound notes in the UK. The next revision of the tenor could be our last chance before co coins and notes are retired, ironically due to the technology that Turing was the grandfather of. He gives us a, a bunch of useful links as well as a direct link to the petition itself, which I'm sure we can link to in our show notes. What do you think? Replace Charles Darwin? It's bold stuff. You know, yeah, there's been a lot of uh, movements to try to, you know, rehabilitate Alan Turing's legacy, and not all of them have been successful. So I think this is not, you know, the most important one, but I, I, it's kind of cool. David, what do you think? That's a tough one. And that's like, I think they need to be in a cage match, basically. They just, just sick them against each other. Google fight? Winner, winner walks out. And survival of the fittest. No, you know what? Already, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, survival of the fittest, you know who's going to win. I mean, that's exactly. Not so, but, you know, Turing, Turing's out, I'm afraid. Well, you could have an artificial intelligence against the natural sort of thing. That's it. It yeah. could be yeah, survival of the fittest versus like a robot. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the robot, the uh, evolved robot. Maybe you can just have them both on. Arm and arm. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for this edition of Tech News Today. Uh, David, thanks so much for taking the time to hang out with us and be on the show today. It was great having you along. Oh, my God. You guys are great. Thank you so much. Anytime. Uh, let folks know where they can find you on the web and, and follow all the things that you do. Uh, Twitter, best way to, uh, that's where I usually spout forth, you know, everything. Yeah, so just uh, as you can see. Well, the audio at people can't see, so. Oh, right. Oh, sorry. Yes, <laughs> all right. that's true. There's that. Yes, at D Hewlett is the, uh, is, the, is the Twitter handle. And like all people with uh, properly spelled last names, he has two T's. D-H-E-W-L-E-T-T. -E uh, that's it for us. You can find our uh, subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, place to go to suggest links and stories that you would like us to talk about on the show. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call, leave us a voicemail. Our number is 260-TNT-SHOW. You can attach them as well, uh, or even upload them to SoundCloud or something like that. Veronica Belmont's on the show tomorrow. We'll see you then.